Here's the deal, Dave. Uh, it's Greg. Yeah, I know. I know it's Greg, Dave. But here's the thing. Ever since I put you in charge of social media, it just really hasn't been working out. It's not my sweet spot. All right. I I'm an accountant. First of all, you don't have to sign your name after everything. What are you, my dad? Well, again, I... And then I have six tweets after that that just say Google.com. Now, I can't even figure out, like, what was going through your brain when... Were you trying to Google from within Twitter? Please don't answer that. Long story short, my little brother is about to graduate from high school. He's got like 10,000 followers. I don't know how he does it. No one does. But we're going to put him in charge of this, okay? So go ahead and send me an electronic mail with the usernames and passwords. Think you can handle that, Dave? Or do you need to write it down on your little pen and paper? I can handle that. Okay, great. And then after that, we're going to talk about your future here at this company. Thank you. You want an email? I'll give you an email. Dear Hipster Doofus. Here are your painfully obvious passwords. You bearded, no good, sneaker wearing. Oh, that's good. I haven't heard language like that since the Navy. Just because Daddy owns the company... Ooh, that's dark. But I like it. Hey, Greg. Yeah, Mike? You know you've been tweeting? I've been twittering?! Greg, 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 come on, join me. Greg, 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 Greg. <laughs> I love that video. It's so bad. I tell you, that was. Uh, I want to welcome you to community today. This is uh, part two, and me and my big mouth a series. And so, so glad that you're joining us. And I want to welcome those of you that are back for the first time. Every week is awesome to see more people coming back for the first time after a year away. I want to welcome those of you that are watching online as well. Thank you for joining us. Well, as I said, today is part two in our teaching series on me and my big mouth. And the tongue has the power of life and death. I mean, the tongue can speak life into another person and build them up and encourage them. But at the same time, the, the tongue can speak death. It can just destroy. It can decimate a person. Last week in part one, we went to the book of James and we went to James chapter one, verse 19. It was our key verse. It's coming up on the screen right now. I'd like to ask you if you would just go ahead and read last week's verse out loud with me as we get started today. Here we go. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. And what I did last week, even though it's a small verse, I even condensed it and just said, you know, quick to listen, slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to speak. Say it with me. Quick to listen, slow to speak, quick to listen, slow to speak. I don't know about you, but I thought about that during the week this past week. I mean, I had an opportunity where I wanted to be quick to speak. I mean, I really did, but I'm hearing the words of James, quick to listen, quick to listen, quick to listen, slow to speak. And I heeded these words and it served me well and I adverted a, a bad situation because I just wanted to lean into it, but I, I did not. And uh, our words are powerful. It's been estimated that the average person says 18,000 words a day. Now, if you were to make that into book form, we speak on the equivalent of a 54-page book every single day. Now, some of us in this room, we're above average. It's not 18,000, it's 25,000 or 30, or we double that, 36,000 words per day. Raise your hand on this. How many of you know someone who just, well, talks too much? Anybody? Okay. Now, don't look at them if they're here. I mean, that would not go well for you. I just, you know, if they're next to you, just kind of like, you know, just keep your eyes ahead and just put your hand down and don't even glance over them. It wouldn't, would not go well. Now, it's true that words just take seconds to say, but the damage from some of the words that we say literally can last a lifetime. Remember when you were a kid, maybe somebody called you a name and you were encouraged to say what? Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never 
hurt me. That's the biggest lie we were told as kids. I mean, we know that. And we might say that, and then as soon as we said that, we'd you know, run home and cry our eyes out because we were called fatso or four eyes or doofus or whatever it was we were called the name. Because we know the truth of the matter is so that words do hurt. Words are incredibly painful. Maybe what we should say is sticks and stones may break my bones, but they may soon be mended. Your harmful words broke my spirit. And the pain, well, it's never ended. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18 says, reckless words pierce like a sword. And we've been on the receiving end of reckless words, so we know that to be true. I have a pastor friend in California. Last year, he put on his uh, Facebook page, he asked this question, what's the most hurtful thing ever said to you? And, and I, I came to it late, and it was... Uh, you know, just a few hours after he posted this, and there were hundreds, hundreds of responses from people. And I gotta tell you, it was, it was just painful to read these words. Here, here are some of them. I was 18, and my widowed father, after nine years of bitterness and verbal abuse, sat me down to tell me that he was leaving. And he said, I don't wanna know who you marry. I don't wanna know your kids. I would rather die on the sidewalk than step foot in your house. Another person, at the rehearsal dinner the night before my wedding, my mom drank too much, and at the end of the evening she said, I always liked your brother better. Another, you would be so pretty if you would just lose weight. Another, I lost my baby boy at seven months. Just less than two months later, a friend of mine said to me, during a really tough morning experience, she said, we're all sick of hearing about your dead baby. After 24 years of marriage, I heard, I don't love you anymore, I'm in love with someone else. Someone said, you're not depressed, you just want attention. God couldn't possibly use you. Another, when I was young, my parents had divorced and my mother remarried and had another child with my stepfather. One night after drinking, she came into my room and she told me, if it wasn't for you, we would have our nice little family. After my wife was diagnosed with leukemia, some members of our previous church told us that she had cancer because she didn't have a strong enough faith. Others said that we weren't praying hard enough. Someone went as far as saying it was because she had sin in her life. And the last one, upon hearing the horrific news that her had that her daddy had not survived the car crash, my daughter turned to me and said, I wish it had been you instead. Painful words, hurtful words create painful memories. And we all know the reality of that. If I was to ask you what was your most painful moment, I'm sure one or two th or three things would come quickly to mind and we'd be taken to a pretty dark place. A key verse for this entire series is Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. The tongue has the power. It has the power of life, but also of, of death. And you know this because it's easy for you to recall life-giving words that were somebody spoke life over you. They spoke life into you or somebody just spoke painful, harmful, destructive words. And maybe it's just three or four or five words that were spoken to you by a parent, a, a teacher, a sibling, a friend, a, a coach. Just a few short words and, and some words just brought life to your soul. And in other words, they just brought some death to your soul. Words have the incredible power to either bless or to curse, to build up or to tear down. Now, evidently, James who we read last week, who's the brother of Jesus, now an apostle. James was writing to people who were definitely struggling with some speech issues. I mean, they were struggling and using very damaging language that was just being very painful to other people because James didn't just address it in one verse in chapter one. It's a theme, it's a theme that appears again and again throughout this letter that he wrote. And we, we see in James chapter one, verse 19, again, everybody should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to 
to become angry. James is not done. Far from it. Verse 26 of chapter 1. Those who consider themselves religious and do not keep a tight rein on their tongues deceive themselves and the religion is worthless. He asks in James chapter 4 verse 1. He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? And then in chapter 4 verse 11 he said, brothers and sisters do not slander one another. He wouldn't have written that if they weren't slandering one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it. And then we go to the key verse, which is found in Judge, I mean, in James chapter 3. In James chapter 3, if you have your Bible today, we're going to be in chapter 3. We're going to work through literally verse by verse, starting in verse 1, going all the way through verse 14. But our key verse for today's message is James chapter 3, verse 10, and it's on the screen. Would you read this out loud with me? And would you read it good and strong? Here we go. James chapter 3, verse 10. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. And so James is like this skillful physician who helps to try to diagnose this dichotomy of words that we speak that come out of the same mouth. Out of the same mouth there come words of praise and cursing, words of life and words of death, words of building up and words of tearing down, all from the same mouth. And it's as if James is saying, I want to talk about your tongue because your tongue just reveals what's inside of you. It's, it's not really your tongue. It's what's inside of you. It's what's going on inside of you. It reveals your character. It reveals the condition of your soul because words, words matter because the words that come out of our mouth reveal the spiritual condition of our heart. And so that's why he spends his time. I mean, he, he spends a significant chunk of real estate of his letter just talking about our speech. And he starts in James chapter 3. Verse 1, and we read, Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. <laughs> Those are kind of daunting words for me because I, I'm one who speaks and teaches. James warns us not to be quick to be the role of a person who teaches spiritual things because we're going to be judged more quickly. And as I read that in preparation for this message, I thought about, I thought about that now would be the time that I would just in the message, close in prayer, and then we would all just go home <laughs> because, uh, because of this warning that James gives. But the teacher places himself or herself in greater danger because they use the tongue, and the tongue is not controlled. It's not tameable. Verse 2, we all stumble in many ways. Anyone who never is at fault in what they say is perfect. I heard about a pastor that kind of does like I do every now and then. I'll ask a question, ask you to raise your hand, that kind of thing. And he asked a question. He was not expecting a result, uh, a response in any kind of way because he said, is anybody perfect in this room? And he'd asked it before. Nobody would ever raised their hand. But he asked it one time and a guy raised his hand and he goes, excuse me, uh, sir, I, I said, is anybody perfect in this room? And the, your hand is still up. And he goes, Sir, are you saying that you're perfect? Oh, I'm not saying that I'm perfect. I'm raising my hand in memory of my wife's first husband. Evidently, he was perfect. And so, <laughs> but we know the truth that none of us are perfect. No perfect people allowed. We have a sign out front. So none of us are perfect. So let's move on. And James gives us three, three very powerful examples of uh, how strong the tongue really is. Verse three, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Has anybody ever done that? I, I'm a city slicker, so I've never put a bit in the mouth of a horse. Anybody ever? We got a few, not a lot here in South Florida, which I get that. But, but I read that the, the bit, you know, I knew it was a piece of metal. It's usually about five inches long, maybe six if it's a big horse and it's put in the mouth. And it's amazing how just with the range, you can turn this big, strong animal with just this little tiny bit. Important example for us about our tongue. Verse four, or, t or take ships as an example, although they are no so large and they're driven by strong winds, they're steered, steered by a very small rudder whenever the pilot, wherever the pilot wants to go. So you have this big, huge ship and the wind and the waves are blowing and yet the captain of the ship is able to direct the direction of the ship by this small rudder. And the third example, verse five, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body but it makes great boast. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Remember Smokey the Bear? He told us all of our lives, only you can prevent forest fires. Just a smart, a smark, spark, a small spark. 
<laughs> We're talking about speech, and I'm having a hard time talking in this service, which is uh, appropriate. So, <clears throat> Just a spark can devastate thousands of acres. And actually, uh, Smokey the Bear's little slogan changed in 2001. Not that it really matters, but if you're on, ever on Jeopardy, here you go. It's no longer only you can prevent forest fires. Now it's no longer that. I, I've not seen Smokey in a long time, but Smokey Bear now says only you can prevent wildfires because of all the wildfires out west and in Arizona and California and Colorado, and they just decimate just hundreds of thousands of acres. And I think the point James is making with the bit, the point that he's making with the rudder, the point that he's making with this small spark is that something small, something very, very small has disproportionate power that small words make a huge impact. And we all know that to be true. Let's take a few moments to think about the damaging words that might show up on an MRI of your tongue. I actually put in MRI of the tongue Googled it, and a video came up on YouTube, and I watched a live video of an MRI of somebody that was playing a bugle, of somebody that was speaking and doing all these different things. It was kind of creepy. I wouldn't advise you to do it. You just see this inside this tongue. But what if, what if James did an MRI of your tongue, of my tongue, and what if he was able to determine what, what is the, the problem with the tongue that we happen to have in our bodies? Would would the word gossip be written on that? Would he discover that there's an issue that we have with, with slander? There's something magnetic about gossip. There's something that's kind of seductive about slander. That's why people are drawn to tabloids and tabloid TV. And slander, it, it just, it sells. And Proverbs 26, 22 says, the words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the inmost parts. Somebody said that gossip is something that that you say behind someone's back that you would never say to their face. On the other hand, flattery is something that you would say to someone's face that you would never say behind their back. Gossip is something that's not honoring to God in any kind of way. And he who gossips to you will gossip about you. We just need to be reminded of that. Here's a good definition of gossip. Gossip is sharing anything negative about someone when the act of sharing it is not a part of the solution of their problem. If you hear kind of slanderous information, negative information about another person, and you choose to pass that on, and you're not a part of the solution, then you are definitely a part of the problem. And that certainly is not honoring to God, and it's a problem with our tongue. And James gives us advice that it's, well, the tongue has the power of, of life and of non-life, of death, the proverb writer tells us. James talks about the tongue because the tongue was the primary vehicle of communication in that day. I mean, it was an oral society in that way, and people communicated with words. If he was writing today, he would have to spend more time than just the spoken word. I mean, if James was writing today, he would have to spend time, I think he would have to talk a little bit about email. He definitely would have to talk about social media. He'd have to talk about, spend a few verses on Facebook and and Insta, and also on Twitter, he'd have to do that. There's no question about that. For some reason, when, when somebody is behind a screen, they can say some of those painful, horrific, attacking, destructive words, and they feel like, well, they're not held accountable for that, or they just don't care. Slander and gossip also happen within the church, but you know we're sophisticated about how we do that. We're kind of a little sly about how we gossip within the confines of the church. We say things like, hey, you better keep Ken and Ruby's 17-year-old daughter on your prayer list. Well, why is that? You haven't heard? No, I, I haven't heard. Well, let's just say you just need to keep her on your prayer list. Well, maybe you could tell me what I need to be praying for so I can pray for her a little bit more specifically. You want to tell me? <laughs> Well, I probably should. But you're going to hear about it anyway. Um, she, she's on meth. No kidding. How did that happen? Well, not really sure. But some people think, you know, it's that Johnson boy that she's been dating. That snake. I knew he was no good at all. I'll be praying for both of them. <laughs> and in the church, we don't gossip. We just share prayer requests. <laughs> That's what we do. That's how we roll. 
Now, slander is an attempt to destroy somebody's name, somebody's character, somebody's reputation for the sheer perverse pleasure of just destroying someone and tearing them down. Slander today is just known as cancel culture, but it has been around forever. Maybe we tear people down because we just want to build ourselves up and make ourselves feel better. You want to know what also might show up on the MRI of our tongue? It might not be gossip or slander. Maybe it is for you. If it is, then, then God's calling you to, to change in that area. Maybe it's broken confidences, which would show up on your MRI of the tongue. And you ever told something of significance to a friend? You've told them you were super clear. I mean, doubly clear. I mean, triply clear. This is confidential. You get the, yeah, 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 I get it. You know, what you say here stays here. No, no problem. But then they told a person and they told another person and before long, everybody knows. I mean, because some people think that a secret is as long as it's still a secret, as long as you only tell one person at a time, then it's still a secret. And over the course of time, you just learn there's some people that you can trust and there's some people that you can't trust. And Proverbs 20, verse 19, a gossip betrays a confidence. So anyone who, so avoid anyone who talks too much. So we need to be people that can hold a confidence. That's what Jesus calls us to. Maybe another thing that might appear on the MRI of some of us is, is grumbling. Some of you are thinking, Scott, are you out of your mind? You gotta be kidding, grumbling? That's my entitlement. I'm entitled to grumble about life. I mean, that can't be, I mean, that's not, what are you thinking? That's not wrong. Really? Is that how you'd respond to that? Well, let's, let's see what God happens to say about grumbling. Is it a big deal with God? Just consider the Israelites, the children of Israel in, in scripture. God delivered them from slavery in Egypt, from poverty, from forced labor, from brutal taskmasters in Egypt. And, and God gave them a, a cloud to guide them by day and a pillar of fire to guide them by night. And God parted the Red Sea so that they could walk across on dry land. And then when they were thirsty, God provided water for them from a rock. And then when they were hungry, God provided food for them, manna, manna from heaven. But was that enough? No, they complained. They complained about everything. They complained about the manna because there are only so many ways that you can prepare manna. I mean, there's manna waffles and manna hotcakes and manna souffles and manna cotti and <clears throat> filet of manna. There's banana bread. I didn't say banana splits, but they probably had those too. So, and they're just saying that we're so thick, we're so sick and tired of manna because there are a limited number of ways that we can prepare this. And they grumbled. And this is how God responded to their grumbling. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the apostle Paul's reviewing the whole wilderness experience of the Israelites. And this is what Paul says. He says, and do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Wow. <laughs> that makes us kind of look at grumbling a little bit differently, doesn't it? Now, why, why, does, why does God have an issue with grumbling? Because it's just being very ungrateful. For the provision of God, for the blessing of God in our life. And if we just grumble about everything that's going on in our life, I grumble about this, I grumble about my job, I grumble about my clothes, my house, my, my car, my kids, my spouse, I just grumble, 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 and we're just not grateful at all. And it's incredibly dishonoring to God. Friends, we're so blessed. We really are so blessed. And we have so much to be grateful for, and yet we, we do grumble. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, he wrote these words, Philippians 2.14, do everything without grumbling. <laughs> I still remember the moment when I heard that the first time. Not this verse, but when I heard it used in a specific context. I was a youth pastor in Clearwater at the time. I was picking up some kids from my youth group from camp. I was at Lake Aurora camp, and there's another youth pastor friend that spoke to one of the kids in my youth group, and he said, hey man, 2.14. go, okay, yeah, all right. 
and I go, 2.14, it was Philippians 2.14, do everything without grumbling. We've talked about grumbling, you know, teenagers grumble. And I go, that's gold. I took that back and that became a theme verse for our youth group. Every single kid, they didn't know any other scripture, but they knew 2.14. I mean, we didn't even say Philippians, we just said 2.14. I wasn't even the enforcer of 2.14. One of the kids would start whining about something, they'd say, hey man, 2.14. To the point that when my own boys, when they were in adolescence and we were on a family vacation and it was one of those drive family vacations and they were tempted to whine a little bit, I enforced 214 for our family. And if I ever, you ever hear me start to whine? You ever hear me start to complain? Go ahead and say, Pastor Scott, 214, 214. I give you permission to do that. Now, when I do it, generally it's because I have a spiritual concern, but when you do it, it's sin and you need to cut that out, okay? <clears throat> okay, there is a difference. There is a difference. We just need to understand. Okay, we need to move on. <laughs> this is about speech and here I am lying right in the middle of a message right here. Okay, we need to move on. So what do you think would show up on your MRI of your tongue? Would it be gossip? Would it be slander? Are you pretty rough on social media? Would it be broken confidences? Would it be grumbling? I think all of us could say, okay, you got me on the grumbling thing. Maybe exaggeration. Maybe it'd be dishonesty. Maybe it would be stretching the truth. Maybe it'd be just deception, lying. Maybe it'd be profanity. Maybe it's the careless use of the holy name of our God or the careless use of the holy name of, of Jesus in our speech. Maybe you're bilingual when it comes to the language that you use. And what I mean by that is you have, you have one set of words for a certain group of people and you have another entirely another set of words for a different group of people. Now, I know what that's like because I was a prodigal in high school. And so I tried to keep those language groups separate, but every now and then I was not good at keeping them separate because I had two completely separate language groups for different groups of people. And the hypocrisy and the lack of integrity in that is not honoring to God. What would an MRI reveal about, about your tongue, about your tongue? Now, I know all of us have the temptation just to say, Scott, it, they're just words. It's no big deal. It's just benign. And I, I think James, because he had probably talked about this and taught about this to other people, is a, kind of the chief spiritual leader in the city of Jerusalem would be tempted to react this, knew that we would react this way because other people would just kind of roll their eyes at James when he would talk about this. And he's, so he gives us, he doesn't stop. He's already given us, you know, five verses about this, but he doesn't give up. I mean, he's relentless on this topic. And so look at what he says in verse six about how benign our words really are. So the tongues also is a fire. It's a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body sets the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. Wow, James, I mean, you're, just, it's, you're telling me, first of all, it's kind of like a rudder and it's like a spark and it's like a bit, but now you're, you know, you're taking this one to the, to the mat here. Verse seven, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Now, do these sound like his, his language is not mild. His language is not restrained. I mean, he is just driving this home with the rapid fire of a machine gun. James says the uncontrolled tongue is this world of evil. It's destructive. And he's just telling us what we already know. The tongue has the power, the power of life, but also it has the power of death. Does that sound like a benign little cyst he's talking about or more like a malignancy that can just lead to death? The tongue has the power of life and death in a marriage. The tongue has the power of life and death in a friendship. The tongue has the power of life and death among colleagues. The tongue has the power of life and death in the church. James says, no one can tame the tongue. I can't tame the tongue. You can't tame the tongue. Nobody can get control of the tongue, especially without the power of God in our lives. Words can start a fire and the smoke damage from that fire just linger in relationships for a long time. And James just decides, okay, I'm gonna keep going here. Verse nine, with the tongue we praise our Lord and Father and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise 
and cursing. Now let's think that, let that sink in for a moment. James is saying that the tongue, this, that the tongue that can bless God, the tongue that can worship God, the tongue that can sing to God, the tongue that can, can praise God and then can turn around and can curse or defame or denigrate or criticize or use a sly innuendo, that tongue, that tongue needs, needs help. What's the problem with the tongue? James goes on, verse 11. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? Not at all, they would respond. They know because of what's inside it, they, is going to affect what comes out, as James is now communicating to us. Verse 12, my brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. What's inside of you is what comes out of you, is what James is saying. And what James' diagnosis of a tongue that can praise God and curse God, James' diagnosis for you and for me is that the heart of the problem is really the problem of the heart. And you really don't have a speech problem. I don't have a speech problem. I have a heart problem, which is much worse. It's not about something just kind of slips out of my mouth. It's, it's what's inside of me comes out of me is, is the problem. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. I don't have a speech problem. I've got a spiritual problem. In other words, what comes out of our mouth is an indication of what's really going, down, going on down deep in our hearts. What comes out of our mouth is an index of, of our character, of, of what's residing in our hearts. And I, I can excuse myself when words slip out by saying, oops, you know, I, I, I may have kind of cussed him out or I may have wounded her. I, I may have spread a rumor. I may have grumbled a lot, but to be honest with you, that was really out of character for me. I, I don't know where that came from. I can't say that. I don't know where that came from. Because Jesus said, it's out of the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks. So I know where it came from. It came from inside of me. And that's deeply concerning to me. I can't just write off my careless words as a lack of self-control or a slip of the tongue, I have to admit, you know what? The truth about me, and this is the truth about you too, but the truth about me is there's something inside of me that's not right. Because when that comes out, that reveals that. Our tongues give us away. Our words give us away at what's really going on inside of us. And, and, and that's evident sometimes when something happens. Maybe we get either frightened or we get, you know, we get injured. I mean, you know, the old hammer on the thumb thing. I mean, that's pretty predictable. I mean, but something happens and you say something and you go, oh my word, where did that come from? Or a kid skates, skateboards down your driveway and you lose control and you go, how did, where, wow, how did I react that way? It's because of what's going on inside. In James 3, verse 14, James describes those who harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition. Where? In your hearts. Again, so he's making this connection. Jesus made this connection. It's out of the heart. The overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. Show me someone who speaks with critical words and I'll show you someone who's full of bitterness and resentment. Show me someone who speaks with dishonest words and I'll show you someone who has a deceptive heart, a deceitful heart. Show me someone who speaks with harsh words and I'll show you someone whose heart has just become calloused. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. I don't have a spiritual, I mean, I don't have a speech problem. I have a spiritual problem. James is not trying to get us to act like followers of Jesus. G James is not even trying to get us to, to talk like followers of Jesus, like we, we, we're modeling our outside behavior. What he's going for is he's, he's going for a complete transformation of the heart. That, that's what he wants to see, that, that our hearts are transformed, that we're changed by Jesus. And there's a big difference between, between outward compliance and inner transformation. The apostle Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 12, and I love the Verse one and two, Paul says, so dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies, that's our tongues, our mouth, 
and our hearts, our bodies to God because of all that he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. And then verse two, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world that just bring death with their language. Don't copy that, bring life. The tongue has the power, yes, but bring life, not death. Don't follow or copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way that you think. And so we let God work inside of us. And so what does all this mean? This means that, that the transformation that needs to happen is not so much an outside thing, it's an inside out kind of thing. And so, and the thing about James, I'll be honest, it's, a, it's such a practical book, but not in this. It's, and, I, and I get this, I mean, I, I thought about different kinds of messages. I like primarily inspirational messages, but I wanted this one. I wanted this message just to be the full weight of James's word, which are just really weighty for us. But I don't want to leave it there. James left it there. It's like, okay, I'm done. Let's move on to another topic. Go, what? Well, where's the help, James? What, what do I do? Where's the practical application? I gave it to you in the first chapter. Quick to listen, slow to speak. And, and that, that's gold. That's but, but I, I want to I, I end on an inspiring note to challenge you to be an inspirational person. I don't think anybody wants at the end of their life to say, you know what? I'm so thankful that with my words, I brought death to other people around me, that, that I just decimated people, that when I'm gone, they'll always remember the time where I just, just laid them out, the time when I just I shut down their dreams. I don't want that. I, I don't want that in any kind of way. I want to be a person that speaks life into somebody. If you were to ask, if I was to ask this question, what's the, one, the most wonderful, the most amazing thing that's ever been said to you? I, I hope that your mind goes there. I want to be that kind of person that speaks life into someone that, that maybe it's not the first thing that comes to a person's mind, but it might make the cut that someone speaks life into another person. The Apostle Paul he wrote these words in 1 Thessalonians 5.11. 1 Thessalonians 5.11. So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. The truth of the matter is it really is not that hard to bring life rather than death. It just takes some intentionality. And so what I want to encourage you to do is to surrender your mouth, to pray every day. God help me to be Quick to listen and slow to speak. Help me to be quick to listen and slow to speak. God, help me with my words to bring life and not death. God, help me with my words to build up and not tear down. And that's a part of your morning prayer because our mouths just direct so much of our lives. And God will answer that prayer. And so we determine that we're gonna encourage and we're gonna build each other up. So I, this is what I wanna do. I, I, want, I wanna give you a seven-day challenge when it comes to your speech that the next seven days at least once a day for the next seven days, you will, with great intentionality, you will build up, you will, you will encourage, you will find someone that you can speak life to and that you will do it. And it might be that you'll simply, you know, write old school a note and slip that to somebody. Maybe you'll take some time and you'll write an email and send it to somebody and who knows, maybe it'll be of the, the substance, it'll be something that, that they will hold on to, that they will treasure for a lifetime. The words, there's something about written words that have a shelf life that you can just send to somebody and maybe you take time to do that for another person. Or maybe you just simply text somebody but you determine that every day over this next week, you're gonna speak life and not death. And not only do you, you speak life to another person, but you express gratitude to God for all of his blessings in your life. And when you begin to be grateful, when, as the old song says, count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. When you are speaking gratitude to God, then grumbling will, it will just dissipate. It will just disappear in your life. And I gotta tell you, when you're doing that, and you have the seven day challenge, you, you might have the best week that you've had in a long time. Don't beat yourself up if you, if you miss a day, but be intentional that this is gonna be what you're gonna do this next week and that you're gonna honor God, you're gonna bless people, you're gonna thank God and you're gonna, uh, you're just gonna do what Jesus is calling you to do. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life, life in all of its fullness and he uses us to help other people experience the fullness of life. It's my goal that the words that I wanna hear most, I won't hear on this side. I'll hear on the other side because I, the words that I wanna hear more than, than anything are, are words just only from Jesus when he says, well done, 
well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. That, those are the words that I'm striving for. Those are the words that, that I want to hear. Not out of some works righteousness kind of thing. I just want to be faithful to him. It says, well done, good and faithful servant. And when we're faithful to him, then we'll hear those words. So I just want to encourage you, friends, that this next week, that, that you will live a life in such a way that you'll hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. That you'll bring life to other people, that you'll be intentional with your walk in such a great way. And we can understand that the tongue, it really does have the power of life and also the power of death, but we're gonna choose life and we're gonna bring life to other people. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I I thank you. I, I thank you, Lord, for these strong and challenging and somewhat discouraging words from the Apostle James, but God, just to be mindful of how powerful our words really are. They're small. They seem to be so insignificant, and yet they have so much lasting effect on other people. Father, I, 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 I pray that every single one of us in this room would be intentional with our words this next week. Father, I, I pray for those who have not yet made a, a decision to follow Christ Jesus as Savior and as Lord, that, that on this day would be their day, that they would determine that they would follow him and they with their words would confess their faith in him, that he is their Savior, their, their, their Messiah, their Lord. Father, I, 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 I pray that you will be with each one of us in this room right now. I thank you, Father, that you are for us, that you are not against us, that Jesus died for us to give us the hope of heaven one day. Father, I I thank you for the amazing relationship that we can have with you through Christ Jesus, and it's in his name and for his sake that we pray today. Amen.